Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mateus. I'm a master's student at the Sao Paulo State University. Um, I started uh, with this field in 2015, the journalism university and journalism uh, course. I started to producing content to impair visual people. I don't have like a, per a personal connection with disability as some other researchers have. Uh, in my years studying journalism, I got in touch with uh, travel journalism too. In my fi final work, in my to get my degree, I did a travel journalism website to impair visual people. So I keep this project and I wrote a project um, in the same line of travel journalism and media and disability. And it was approved to in the Masters on the Media Communication in Sao Paulo State University. And in 2019, I received a scholarship for study for two years by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. Um, I started to building my project on basis on a scientific initiation I did on undergraduation. I did an accessibility check on two news websites on the travel sections. It was two big newspapers in Brazil, Folha de São Paulo and Estado de São Paulo. And there I could find that these sites were lacking accessibility to international standards and potentially it could hinder the social participation. I say potentially because this methodology is good to see the tendencies of inaccessibility, but it's limited once, once you want to know the impacts of the experience and the participation of people with visual impairments. So that way, I had this question in my mind. Are visually impaired people accessing travel journalism? Are there consequences for their social participation? That way, I did this research question. How accessing cyber travel journalism impacts the citizenship of persons with vision impairments. The one thing I would like to add is this uh, approach on citizenship has two motives, one practical and one theoret theoretical. Practical is because my advisor in Brazil, he is a specialist on citizenship. He, is not, he, not, he does not study media and disability. So to find a way to us to study together and to apply for a grant, we have to compromise and find a place where our interests work together. So that's the inclusion of citizenship on the scope of the research. So my research question entails for themes, travel journalism, digital media, disability, and citizenship. And all these themes converge on the media encounter or media interaction. I have this small visualization of my themes, like there's interaction in the center, the visual impaired people, our receptors, in the other side, travel journalism in the, in, on the other, and social participation that is produced on this interaction, and the cyberspace where is the site where this interaction is happening. So just a few theoretical points to my to start. Uh, I assume that people with visual impairments, marginalization is socially produced as the social model of disability. Uh, as many studies have found this and used this model. Another point that uh, I assume is that formats and content of cyber travel journalism have the role of both informing and entertaining possible tourists. So it has an important role on this industry. Sometimes travel journalism can be seen as like an ugly brother of journalism, a journalism that's not that serious, but has serious impacts on cultural exchanges and cultural portrait of different cultures. Um, the case of the specific characteristics of the cyberspace or network society, that the media happens, the characteristics, it's like multimedia, interaction, speed, memory. So all these forms are, will be part of the interaction because of the environment of the cyberspace. And another point of my theoretical basis is that when someone, going back to the 
social model of disability when a person with disabilities will interact with uh, inaccessible me digital media is being produced a digital inequality that's not because of the impairment but it's because of the way the coded are built. So from this interaction there are meanings being produced that can impact to some degree the receptor's citizenship. I approach citizenship through a concept of ideology from this sociologist called John Thompson. He's a British sociologist that studied ideology, media, and communication. This book is called Ideology and Modern Culture. Uh, and he does a rereading of the concept of ideology, rereading Marx and different authors, and he reads this conception of ideology. Ideology refers to the ways that meanings serve in particular circumstances to establish and sustain relationships of power that are systematically asymmetrical. That means ideology is when the meaning is serving power. So that way, if oppressive meanings are being produced, we argue that there is a damage to the citizenship of the person that's receiving these meanings. So these meanings keep certain groups below social participation and an equal opportunity basis. Uh, it's important to notice that oppressive meanings does not only come from the class domination. Capitalism is, is a source of domination, but as Thompson argues, it's not the only one. We have domination. Asymmetry on the asymmetry on basis of race, gender, and disability. So, doing having this in mind, the ideology, meaning, production, and citizenship, I wrote the research question in a different words. How do they produce meanings from this media encounter? People with visual impairments and travel journalism sustain or establish asymmetric power relations based on disability. I have three goals with this research, is to produce a context of the scenario of accessibility inside news companies and the Brazilian legislation, to identify and define the role that travel journalism plays in the information habits of these people, and to understand the impacts of accessing travel journalism has in the citizenship of the group. To do this, I use a methodology that was also uh, elaborated by John Thompson. It's called depth her hermeneutics. It has three steps. The first one is a social historical analysis. The second one, a structural analysis. And in the end, a reinterpretation. Now I'm almost finished. I'm in the reinterpretation phase. So I'm do I haven't finished yet, but it's, it's still going. So each step, each historical, sociohistorical structure and reputation will meet one of my objectives. The social analysis uh, wants to contextualize, contextualize the social historical conditions of the production of meaning on journalism. So I have to look to the context on the production side and the context on the re reception side. So in the production side, I have to look at the mainstream co media companies, the internal policies on accessibility, the legislation of the country, and the news formats, how the, how the formats of journalism that I explained, that Castle said, multimedia, speed, interaction. And on the reception side, I have to explain the social position of impaired visual people in society, the technology they used, and the information needs. To achieve that, I did a bibliographic research on disability, travel journalism, and digital media using keywords on national and international repositories. I did also snowballing, reading articles, and going through different, uh, different authors that link me to uh, different ones. So I read all this list of articles and books that I, I got, and I started to categorize my studies between production studies and reception studies. Then I describe these researchers 
and I did a qualification of them with my theoretical background. Then I did too a documentary research on the legislation and litigations on web accessibility. I choose to also look to litigations because looking that we can see how the legislation works, really works. It's not like the, just the uh, conceptual normative ways, but how the legislation works in reality. So I, would, I won't talk about all the authors I read on my literature review, just a few topics that I think that is important. So in the production side of the studies on disability journalism and media, I, I have two types of studies. Studies that use, that look for compliance to international standards, and research that use the journalist's work as the lens to study media, media and disability. So in, in re, I have just a few critiques to this methodology as I explained before in the beginning. It's a limited technique. Uh, sometimes it's too broad. If you want to look for interaction, uh, this type of analysis looked for broad uh, system, broad codes, and sometimes if a person who has visual impairments will, won't interact with all of these codes that are being analyzed. But it's good to show tendencies. So I found this study in Spain that analyzed two, webs two news websites. In Brazil, another study that analyzed 10 websites. And also my, my first study that analyzed two websites. All these studies can allow us to say that there is a poor compliance to the international standards to accessibility. And we can suggest that these new websites don't consider people with disabilities as their audience. The another type of study is related to the journalists' work. They draw upon how the journalist has responsibility on digital accessibility. So there's this study on Spain that looked for all the errors on news websites and see how the journalists could help to improve these errors and where the programmers and designers could help. And another study at that time in Brazil surveyed journalists to see, to measure uh, their knowledge on web accessibility guidelines and information rights of people with disabilities. Summarizing these studies, we can say that Journalists do have a responsibility on producing content with accessibility, although the companies is the main responsible. They have to draw policies and internal standards to reach a reasonable level of accessibility. And sometimes the journalists are not aware of what accessibility means or what rights someone with impairment have to inform them itself and themselves. To the reception side, there's now to understand the social position of the people with disabilities or visual impairments and their technology they used. I, there's a lot of studies in Brazil in this field, it's more than in journalism. So these studies uh, describe how people with impairments, visual, visual impairments or uh, even here impairments use the internet, uh, how technology they use, and if this can be described as a social produced barriers or the fault of the environment. And there's a lot of group of studies that uh, studies specifically the reception side of the journalism. So there's these studies in Brazil they did like a broad survey online questioning how was the experience of accessing some websites, some news websites, and another one run some uh, accessibility tests with three impaired visual people to see how they interact with the app. And this, both studies came to the conclusion that all these experiences are negative. 
So just to summarize this, this literature review, although there are few studies about travel journalism and accessibility, I look, look, look in the internet and it's very, very difficult to find anything related to travel journalism and accessibility. But there is a reasonable number of studies that deal with journalism in general. So if you, we have in, in mind that travel journalism is a field with unique circumstances, okay, but that echoes the trials and tribulations of media industry overall, that we can include accessibility in these trials and tribulations. So we can deduce that the, the, uh, the problems faced by media companies in general news is the same or very similar to the face it when, it's, when it comes to travel journalism content. And what I found here, my, my conclusions, is that this review shows a disconsideration of accessibility amid news production in Brazil, and there's hurdles to access new content in the part of the reception. This part is essential to my, um, to my final interpretation because uh, the meaning is not produced in a vacuum, the meaning is produced on a social environment, so I have to know what's happening on this context. Also, I did a historical analysis on, on legislation and other documents. I won't say every law because it's extensive and very detailed, but we have like laws that uh, guarantee informational rights in the Constitution. The Brazil is a signatory part on the UN Convention of the, person, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have laws that goes from civil rights saying that you have the right to access internet and even laws to protect consumer on accessibility grounds. But even so, there are no suffi sufficient uh, laws and mechanisms to guarantee access and participation. I, I read to some law commentators because law is not my, my field, so I went to read some law commentators to, to assess this accessibility situation in the legal framework in Brazil. Also, as I, told, as I talked before, there's this litigation it's mainly one civil inquiry that uh, it's about accessibility on news websites. There was a group of hearing impaired people that complained to the public prosecutor office about accessibility of some several websites. And there's a lot of documents that were produced there. The companies say why they are not accessible. So it's a very rich place to research. Uh, and reading these pages, 400 pages, uh, I could see a lack in the answers of the companies. They say that the Brazilian legislation, a lack of a specific, me uh, specific mechanism, a specific definitions to what accessibility entails. Also, they say that to produce accessible content is too expensive and they say that already have accessible websites. But as our literature review shows, that's not completely true. So after doing this contextual analysis and social historical analysis of the context of the production and reception, we went to the structural analysis. I did an adaptation of the structural analysis uh, elaborated by Thompson because Thompson, he, use, he talks about more text. So let's do a, a discursive analysis, argumentative, argumentative analysis, and look for the syntax of the texts. So that's not uh, important to my research. Once I, I'm concerned about the material digital level that is even prior the message, the text level, so in our assumption, in our hypothesis, the material level means something. So with this step, 
we, we want to identify these inaccessible digital structures that produce meanings. So instead of a text analysis, as proposed by Thomson, we did an accessibility analysis of these forms. But we didn't do an accessibility text uh, check, a general accessibility check via software. We want to know the real experience of the visually impaired internauts. So we decided to do interviews to see what specifically type of forms are hamper your access to travel journalism. So my interview with interviews we had two main goals to unveil these inaccessible structures faced by our receptors and another one to map their experience in their online travel news diet that's related to our main objectives that I mentioned before. We, ha we just have one criteria, criteria to choose our interviews. It should have be, they have to be like an internet user with blindness or low vision, and they have to know how to use the internet. The main cr the criteria that you and our interviews is that they need accessibility requirements to access the internet. We know that it's like a limited approach because we don't look at race, we don't look at gender, we don't look at age, we don't look at class, education, or even location. But we are, I am aware, once we frame these, uh, these different factors, we can have some different answers too. For instance, in my research, I interviewed 19 people from ages from 19 to 75. And it's clearly that the young people access more travel journalism online than the old people. So if I did a more a focus group or a, a more uh, specific frame, the young people would have more, in, more importance or different answers from the people that have more age. Uh, to do this questionnaire, I read a lot of studies on travel journalism and media and disability. So I came up with a questionnaire that has five sections. The first one is related to the travel, general, travel information in general. And the second one is about travel journalism specifically. I like to make this distinction between travel journalism and general tourist information. Because there's differences between the content. Uh, to produce journalism, you have to follow a methodology, you have to follow an ethics protocol. And to general travel information, you don't. So you, can, you can have like bloggers and advertisement. All of this is general travel content, but travel journalism is a bit different. The third point of our questionnaire is to search the contents that were being looked for our receptors. And the fourth is the interaction with the forms. That is the part we're most concerned about, the inaccessible forms that they interact with. And in the, in the last, the perceptions of, they have, of the access they have. So I, inter I transcri transcribe all of these interviews that last maybe 20 minutes each one, and I used an um, analysis methodology called content analysis of uh, an author named Laura Spardin. Uh, she said that we have to highlight phrases and words that are related to our questions, then observe the prevalences of these phrases and words, and then describe and Inter provide inferences. Uh, my study, although I, interview, I interviewed almost 20 people, it's not about the statistical analysis, so I didn't do a, a, quantitative, a quantitative study, so it's a qualitative study, 
but I thought that it would be interesting to know the measures of who is accessing and who isn't. So just only eight, per, eight people of my interviews are accessing travel information online, while 11 are not. The main reason that uh, Imperial Visual people access travel information online is to prepare for a trip they are planning or to know, it, to know different uh, destinations or even through advertisement they receive on, on their social media, on their emails or phone. And for those who don't access, we have different reasons. They say that they don't access because they have someone else to access for them, maybe a relative or a friend. They don't have interest in travel at all. They don't have any planned trip. They face barriers on websites. Uh, they prefer to use different sources of information or YouTube, radio, or even television. They say that lack of vision is also a problem in their perspective, that if they had vision, they would access more. And they say that they also have problems on screen readers. Here is the, the specific information about travel journalism. The numbers are significantly different here. Just three of our interviewees access travel journalism. And they access this because they want to know feedback about travelers that went to a specific destination. They want to know general curiosities. For instance, one girl told me she wanted to know like the 10 most famous cafes in a city and what she can do there. And another point, that they, another factor, and they want to know more about one trip they are planning. And the people that doesn't, does not access are 16, is the large number. If their answers are similar to the, to the general travel information. They say they use different sources, they don't have interests, they have, like, they have burden to access, it's difficult to access this type of content. They don't have the ability. This point is interesting for me because my criteria to choose uh, Imperial Visual People was the ability to use the internet. So even among people that know how to use internet, they even think they don't know how because they think they don't have the ability to use. And another point, another, again, the lack of vision is a factor that they mentioned. The section three of our question was related to searched content. I'll go like a little fast here. It's just about destination characteristics, uh, weather and uh, touristic, touristic places and culture of the place. And travel accounts is very similar to feedbacks, like travelers that uh, narrates how was their trip. And accessibility is one import, important uh, content they are looking for. And also travel inspiration. Um, my interviews were complaining about some specific points. They say that travel journalism does not have any what I call inclusive narratives. So there was not, there's few or almost nothing about accessibility or even the content was not accessible completely and they felt that their needs were not being addressed. Just a, a, few, a quick summary of, of the answers of the mapping. So we have that people with visual impairments access travel information for the same reasons as people with, without disabilities. We can say this uh, based on different research made with travelers without disability. They want the same thing, want to inform themselves about a, a next trip, or want to, know a, want to know about the experience of different travelers. Uh, I, we can say that, about, having in mind our measurement, <laughs> travel journalism has a limited sight on their news diet. They access 
are very few websites. But we can say that there is an interaction. Even if like a, a mild interaction, there is one interaction. So there is a meaning being produced. So the most important part of my questionnaire was to know the structures they are interacting with. So I was looking for the inaccessible forms of cyber journalism. After reading all their answers, uh, I found three main factors. They say that long hyperlinks uh, affects their navigation, images or videos without description, and the text disorganization. So long links, one of the interviews was telling me, sometimes he, she is na navigate, using the internet and she stops on a, on a link that's so long and the screen reader starts to read, 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 read. So it's harm the navigation. Uh, it turns the navigation, it's very slow. Uh, one thing I can say about this is like, these long hyperlinks hijack the reading flow. Uh, the screen readers read meaningless numbers and letters. One of my interviews said to get to the content is a hassle, it's very difficult. The ad another form is the images without description. So, they, when they want to access some image, sometimes there are nothing describing the image, sometimes there are even links inside the image code. So we can say that there is a concealment of the image message. Uh, when, as one of my interviews said, I don't have the sensation of knowing how beautiful this is. And this is very common in travel journalism. They use lots of photos of destinations, they rely on beautiful sceneries, mountains, and beaches. So sometimes they're describing the text, oh, beautiful beaches, but, and they publish the photo, but how someone with a vision impairment will know this without some description. So all the contours of the photo are concealed too. And one, the last factor, it was not that common, but was mentioned was the text disorganization. Uh, they said that sometimes they are using their screen readers and instead of reading fluently, the screen reader starts to spelling each letter. So it's also harms the navigation and turns neg navigation in a, in a very negative experience. They also have some strategies to lift down the barriers. Uh, they all, all of them told me they have a sighted person that they ask for help. That's the, the most used strategy. But here there's an important thing that when they, they are using the internet by themselves and they find uh, a barrier, they have to call someone and all the navigation stops. They have to stop everything and wait hours and hours to get the information they could have fast but if the website was properly coded. Another strategy is just dispose the website. I don't want to see this website anymore. Another one was using image text translation apps, but similarly to the help from the sighted person, it's a very trouble work, you have to take time to do this. Or one of the, the answers is to get off from the online perspective and call to the physical place to see if they can help you. And by this, this my interview said that if the companies change their posture towards people with disabilities, providing more description, more audio description, more mouseless navigation, they would access more this travel journalism. One of the things that one of my interviews said is nobody who access a website can see. So they want to, the companies be aware of that. In the last point of my interviews, 
is the sentiments and, perspe and perceptions of social participation that will influence my meaning production. One of the main feelings that uh, people with impairments have is frustration. When they have a barrier, they feel frustrated and they also feel irritated, they feel impotent and they feel, they feel that they are being excluded. Another sentiment is that they don't see themselves as the imagined audience and they have to use constantly alternative paths. So the mainstream is not for them, so I have to make on my own path. Uh, another point is that when they find barriers or some inaccessible content, they can, this can hinder their mortality. Some people told me they gave up of doing a trip they had planned because they couldn't found, find information of accessibility of this place. Another point is that in their perspective, people without disabilities have more possibilities as like fast navigation or more independence in them. them. So they felt they're being like a second class consumers. Uh, I asked too if they considered that an accessible content uh, could harm their social participation. I thought that was interesting this question because some people said to me, no, I don't think that this harms my citizenship because I go there, I don't mind about anything. If I care about this, I will not get out of my house. But other people will say, that, yes, uh, this harm my participation. Sometimes I want to do something and I know though I don't know about this, so I stay at home. Uh, I lose information I would find interesting. So there's these two visions. I this don't harm my social participation, or no, this harms my social participation. So just a quick summary. I have my interviews and I did a mapping of the news diet and then the gathering the symbolic forms, structures and perceptions. So finally, I, I have the reinterpretation phase that is still ongoing. I'm looking for different uh, ways of interpreting this yet. So the aim of my reinterpretation is to explain the connections between, between the meanings of travel journalism forms. So that three forms, I found that inaccessible forms as long hyperlinks, uh, <coughs> images without description and text disorganization. And how these uh, have meanings and domination. How can I connect this all together? So just one important point, going back to the interpretation of ideology. Uh, when we talk about domination and we want to interpret this domination, this is automatically a critique of domination. So it's, a, it's not a neutral analysis, so we are criticizing the domination. Uh, one thing that I have to say too is that when I start to interpret something. I have to prove my interpretation. I not have to impose something. I have to show the arguments I'm using. But even so, there is a possibility of interpret. There is a conflict of interpretation. It's intrinsic to all interpretation process. Uh, but by doing this contextual analysis and internal analysis, I can avoid a reductionism for just looking for the context or an internalism to try to draw a meaning just for just at looking at the structural forms. So one of the uh, meanings I have in mind is the meaning of unification. Thompson says that this strategy of meaning is the construction of a unit that connects connects individuals to a collective, collective identity. So in our case, these units 
are the long hyperlinks, images without description, and text disorganization. And these three forms, they create a collective identity of an internet user that without vision impairments. That means they, they create a patronization of what means to be an internet user. So once you create, you create a pattern, you automatically create a deviance and you create exclusion. So that's one of the meanings I'm looking at. I just to notice, uh, these three structural forms are not oppressive itself, intrinsically. I have to consider the context. For instance, if we these forms interact with people without impairments, with sighted people, there won't be oppressive forms or oppressive meanings being produced there. Another forms I'm looking at, I didn't develop a lot yet, is the legitimization. So when inaccessible forms are treated as fair and based on legality or rational norms. This is used by the companies when they say, I'm not doing anything illegal. So they legitimize their oppression by saying this. Another point is the naturalization. When you treat some, some oppression as natural, as high historical, as not a construction of societal oppressing, but just a given. And also hegemony, bring the difference between people with impairments and without, people with disabilities and without disabilities. There's a kind of hegemony of the able body. And distancing, that people with disabilities start to distance themselves of this type of content because of the inaccessibility of their farms. So that's what I'm, I had prepared. So I'd like to hear your opinions on the research.